everyone, welcome to The Sword and Laser. I'm Veronica Belmont. And I'm Tom Merritt. What? Oh, uh, Lem says the fuel gauge is running low. Oh, well good thing it's the last episode of season two. We are almost done! Yes, we are! It's, uh, I'm sorry we're going to have to go, but thank you for making it possible. It's been 12 amazing episodes, and it's all thanks to you. Yes, and of course we still have one more author spotlight left to go. Uh, this is the show where we put in an awesome author, extract the essential elements of their spirit, divine their hidden purpose, and then cause them to divulge long sought after answers. Hmm. So well put. Thank you. Uh, we begin the procedure with six essential elements divined of N.K. Jemison. Jemison was born in Iowa City and grew up in New York City and Mobile, Alabama. She now lives in Brooklyn, New York, where she works as a counseling psychologist and educator. She has cited John Coltrane as an influence and has said that she admires how when he played his music, he would get caught up in it playing for himself. The rest of us are just along for the ride. In 2010, her short story, Non-Zero Probabilities, was a finalist for the Hugo and Nebula Awards. Her novel, The Killing Moon, was nominated for the Nebula Award in 2012 and the World Fantasy Award in 2013. Her first novel, The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms, was published in February 2010 by Orbit Books and was nominated for the 2010 Nebula Award, the 2011 Hugo Award, and the World Fantasy Award, and was shortlisted for the James Tiptree Jr. Award. Jemison is a former member of the Boston area writing group Brawlers, as well as a current member of the Altered Fluid writing group. She listed Mira Grant's Parasite, Naomi Novik's Blood of Dragons, and Anne Leckie's Ancillary Justice among her favorite books of 2013. Ah, yes. But what other hidden gems lie in the world of Ms. Jemison? Aaron, to the whiteboard! Here's a funny word. Simulacrum. Literally, it's just a copy. Literarily, it's a key critical concept in postmodern theory, forwarded by Jean Baudrillard. Short version. A simulacrum is a copy which supersedes the original. Reality, it turns out, is sometimes less compelling than a dramatic or simplified fictionalization. Huh, imagine that. In my case, this can lead to some serious self-reproach. Social awkwardness means I tend to eke out my insights into human nature from fantastic fiction, rather than any real human interactions, but there's no excuse for my evading history and philosophy texts as frequently as I do. Professional obligations aside, I'm a literary coward. That's why it's such a guilty pleasure to read works by N.K. Jemison, which are meaty enough as any actual history, even if they're detailing a fictional country. Of course, speculative fiction has a strong tradition of engaging with moral quandaries, from Star Trek to Batman. It helps when, as in the case of Jemison's Inheritance trilogy, we are able to directly interrogate the gods and demand directions. Of course, things are never so easy. Even in fictional theology, and what we find in Jemison's work is that the paths of the gods are as flawed as those of the human protagonists, and it's sometimes difficult to tell the immoral schemers from the friendly collaborators. Personal motivations get complicated with the political. Hmm. It's kind of like history, only with magic. Batman Star Trek. That is so true. I, 100,000 Kingdoms is one of the books that I've read where I forgot it was fiction while reading it. Wow, so nice. So subsumed with it. All it's right. A, yeah, I did, good, good job with that one, Aaron. Uh, but enough talk. We must consult the source of this magic. We conjure you, N.K. Jemison. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Hello, thank you for inviting me. Of course. Now, uh, of course, we, we read The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms for Sword and Laser uh, a while back, actually, um, as you may recall, because you came on the audio podcast. Um, mm -hmm. And then recently, we actually read it for my other book club, Vaginal Fantasy. Now, that's mm. that's more typically a, a romance-style book club show. Um, and I was wondering, do you, how do you feel about having that, that book sometimes put into that genre category or people referring it as a as having romance elements to it do you, do you feel like that's kind of weird or outside of how you would categorize it yourself it's definitely not weird um when i when i wrote the novel i really had no idea what genre it was um and in fact i sent it to my agent and said send it to whatever publishers you think it will go with um and i think that she did send it to a few romance publishers um and it it kind of sits between genres anyway so i'm perfectly fine with people taking the pieces from it that they like and you know uh paying attention to those more than others if they like um if romance folks think it's fantastic, great. Um, if other people think it's fantastic, great. If other people have a problem with the romance being in it, that's not so great, but you know, it's okay, I'll live with it. Well, do you think about yourself as writing in a genre then, or do you just write stories? I write what I feel like writing, oh. 
and then I see who responds to it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I will say that I kind of have started phrasing myself as a fantasy writer, but that's mostly because my books have been positioned as fantasy. But I don't think I ever really kind of initially thought of myself as that. Um, and in particular as epic fantasy, I, I wasn't sure what flavor of fantasy it was. It, it was just, okay, it, I'm writing stuff, there are magical things happening in it, but there's also science. So I have no idea what it is. And, you know, as long as people like it, that's really all I care about. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I never would have categorized the book as as, as a romance novel, and I, I, I still wouldn't. And I was actually mm -hmm. surprised when one of my fellow hosts on, on VF uh, so, you know, suggested the book for for the club, um, because mm -hmm. even though I think it's a fantastic book, it just didn't, didn't pop up into my head that way. And it makes me mm -hmm. wonder, because there's a lot of fantasy books out there, like the first one that comes to mind is another one we read um, uh, the Bobby Dollar series by Tad Williams also has mm. you know it has romance and it has sex in it but mm. I don't think anyone would ever consider that to be a romance novel either so it, it's just interesting the way I wonder if it's because it has a mainly female protagonist that people kind of you know make that assumption I would say it's partly because it's a female protagonist and also because it has a female author. Mm -hmm. um, I use initials on, on uh, as my publishing name, but uh, I think I'm pretty out about being female. Um, and I, I go to conventions. Well, you are now. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I identify as female, just FYI. Um, and, and so I think people know that and they react to it. Um, and there is a tendency, particularly in, uh, in certain genres of the fiction field, to automatically assume that woman plus female protagonist, I'm sorry, woman author plus female protagonist plus romantic elements anywhere in the point of the story equals romance. Right. Um, even though the same formulation, if you change any part of that, male protagonist, male author, no one would jump to that conclusion. So there's there's something else going on there that makes that formulation possible. And weirdly, um, there's actually been male authors who, who do the same thing you do and either use mm. their first initials when they want to write in the romance genre because mm. they're worried that women won't read them because they're a male author. Right, right, right. And that's an understandable fear on their part. But, you know, I actually, when I when uh, The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms first came out, I went to the Romantic Times Book Lovers Convention and um, had a wonderful time. Uh, it was my first time going there. I had never been to any romance convention before. And one of the things I was kind of fascinated by was how eclectic and voracious romance readers are. Um, they would read anything. And... It, it, I was actually a little scary at one point in the convention because they, in in a funny scary way um because they had this um sort of book buying competitive uh meat market it was it was <laughs> yeah the, they have this um like the shopping bag race where you go through the grocery store but with almost books? yeah almost i'm um, i'm not kidding i'm really not kidding they have this event during the convention where they have all these authors with their tables and their little stack of books um situated in a giant convention hall um, and they have the doors locked until a certain hour and then they open the doors and people run in with shopping bags, suitcases. I saw one woman with an Ikea bag on each shoulder, her husband in tow with an Ikea bag on each shoulder, each of her two children each carrying an Ikea bag, wow. all of them wandering down the halls roving like this, looking for books. And yeah, that was... I've never seen that kind of thing before, and it was awesome and amazing, and and like I said, a little scary, but at the same time, in a good way. Was there one so, person smirking in the corner with a Kindle? Just <laughs> <laughs> no, they wanted real physical books. They, yeah, yeah. yeah. They wanted they, they. It was a visceral. Yeah, I mean, they were, they were touching them. They were yeah, they were like, we've we've got to have these books. Huh. So, it reminds me of the annual uh, five dollar wine sale at my husband's company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the Christmas wine sale. Kind of Coming with bags oh and like giant bags of wine. Yeah, it's kind of kind of sad in a way. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got a bunch of listener questions we want to get to. Uh, the first one comes from Leanne, and it relates to The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms. Uh, Leanne says, I just read it, and I thought it was great. I'd like to know what inspired the God system in that book and how that came about. I am not Im inspired by any one single uh, specific thing. Um, I have all my life loved mythology. Uh, do I have? 
Oh, I was hoping I might have that mythology book around. I think it's on the other side of my bookcase, so I will have to fetch it later. Um, but I, I have an entire shelf of mythology books, including one fantastic picture book of mythology stuff, um, which I read for fun. Um, and I've always done that since I was little, and mythologies of multiple cultures. Um, I love the fact that every culture on this planet pretty much generates interesting stories about uh, what it imagines the divine to be. Um, and I have to admit that I've always liked stories of the divine as um, approachable, flawed, um, kind of messed up people uh, who just happen to have phenomenal cosmic power. Um, and so I tended to write about those kinds of things and, and decided to turn that into a novel in and of itself. Um, but then I would say that an additional inspiration was dreams that I had um, mm -hmm. about various characters who ended up being characters in the story. Um, I had a dream of Nahadoth, um, the, the main god of the story, um, who of the first book. Um, who is the god of night um, and I just had this dream of a man with very long black straight black hair with stars in his hair um, and when you know you you got away from looking at it as hair when you didn't see the shine or the sheen of it um, in the shadows you could see that there were little speckles of light um, and you knew if you touched his his hair you would fall into it and, and die horribly but um, but that was... there's that there's yeah. that little, yeah. little thing yeah that's kind of what my dreams are like. Um, but so, yeah, that, that of course, made it into the story, and including the dangerousness of that. Um, so that was really the idea, um, was blending mythology that I'd spent my life learning about with uh, my fevered imagination and seeing what happened. That's awesome. That's actually a really great way. Yeah, I, I, dreams, dreams are such a good fount of ideas mm -hmm. sometimes, and it's amazing what can come from them. Uh, Nancy mm -hmm. wants to know about your next book, uh, The Fifth Season. Is there anything else that you can tell us mm -hmm. so far, and, and how many books do you have planned for that particular series? At the moment, I have three books planned for it. Um, it is probably going to be my first contiguous trilogy, i.e. not uh, three separate stories with three separate characters. Um, following the story of one person, although there will be many characters in the story. Um, I talked, I think, on my blog a little bit about the, the setting of it, which is uh, it's completely different world um, in which extinction level events, uh, seismic events, um, what they call volcanic winter tends to happen pretty frequently. Um, so every few hundred years or so, um, somewhere on the planet the Earth opens up, um, sky clouds over, winter lasts for years, um, and uh, the whole culture of this world has sort of adapted itself to that. Um, and the story starts in this case with the end of the world. Um, the a, a seismic event of epic proportions has happened, bigger than any other. Um, the the world ends on, I think, page three in the current version. I am <laughs> in the process of doing the revision. I'm going to try and move it to page two. Um, and the story follows a woman who, um, in, in the immediate wake of this, is dealing with a personal tragedy. Her son has just been murdered. Um, and so she goes forth into this world where uh, ash is falling from the sky and people are battening down the hatches and trying to figure out how they can survive this, uh, this apocalyptic future. Well, not future, apocalyptic uh, world uh, that has descended. Um, and people are, are, are adjusting themselves to the possibility that this may be the end for everybody. And she's not even thinking about that. She's like, I got to find the person that killed my kid. Um, and she's got another child that the same person took. And she's hoping to try and rescue her, her remaining child. So it's really um, a story about a single person. It just happens to be in an, in an extraordinary backdrop. Yeah, if it's not one thing, it's another. Somebody kills your kid, steals another, and then the world ends on top of it? Uh, uh, well, yeah, kind of. I mean, she's not even really paying much attention to the end of the world. As far as she's concerned, the world ended when her child died. Yeah, she is. So, that's the least of her yeah. worries. Hmm. Yeah. That, yeah. That sounds fantastic. Um, and that actually leads us well into Dara's question, who notes that all of your novels have been part of a series, and you just mentioned this one will be a series as well. Do you have mm -hmm. any plans to write totally standalone books? I'm not sure. Um, I think this is why the epic fantasy label gets applied to me sometimes, and it's mostly because my ideas don't usually pop up as as nice confined things. Um, 
I will try at some point. I can't guarantee it. And frankly, when the ideas get to novel lengths, they just tend to grow exponentially from there. Um, and it's hard to confine them, really. Um, I love the idea of the, the vast story that is epic in scale and scope. Um, I love the idea of generational stories, as you saw with The, the Hundred Thousand Kingdoms. Um, or stories that cover um, a long period of time uh, in, in, an, in the life of an event, um, so to speak. Um, with the Dreamblood books, for example, uh, we were essentially following a war between two nations over the course of two books. Um, and it covered 10 years, as, as wars and uh, their, their run-up and the aftermath tends to do. Um, and I just... A moment of that doesn't interest me. Um, seeing the big picture does, but I tend to be a big picture thinker and writer anyway. So, mm -hmm. and and you have so much depth in your story as well. I mean, that's that's what I think is so impressive is that you have such a broad view, and yet it doesn't feel like you're seeing all of it. That there's so much more going on behind the scenes. Well, that's that that's the idea. Um, that is. As far as I'm concerned, that's what the best fantasy is supposed to do. Um, you're supposed to be able to open a book and find yourself in a different world. Um, you know, you're supposed to immerse immediately. Um, and it's the writer's job to kind of craft that illusion. Now, you know, the reader does have to meet them halfway and, and be willing to suspend a certain amount of belief. Um, you know, it's always kind of interesting and, and hilarious to me uh, what readers are willing to suspend and which one, what they aren't. Um, <laughs> Every so often you find readers who are like, you know, there can't be black people in medieval Europe, but dragons. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm like, um, I can't wrap like, my okay. head around that. Yeah. 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 And I'm like, OK, well, um, what works for you? Um, but that said, um, it's my job to try and understand and anticipate what the reader's going to be bringing to the table and try and weave what I'm trying to do into that. Um, whether I do it successfully or not is, is up to the reader to determine. But um, for the most part, I think um, I, I, so far people seem to like it. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's safe to I, say I you're doing a pretty good job, I think. Yeah, well, good. Thank you. Alex wants to know, do you ever see yourself either creating something new or adapting current works into the graphic novel format? Uh, personally, I think I could see a lot of your, your, your works really working well in, in that style. I would love to to see a graphic novelization of any of my any of my books or short stories. Quite frankly, um, I can't draw a lick. So if we can find a, a nice, wonderful um, artist, I, I have sort of probably futile fantasies of, of uh, Fiona Staples suddenly deciding she wants to stop doing Saga and come write for me, uh, draw for me, but mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but, you know, if I could find somebody like that who wanted to do it, I would be all over that like white on rice. But um, as, as we speak, my computer is stacked on top of issues of Saga and... <laughs> um, and uh, some other stuff. So, I mean, I, I would be very much interested in that. But as it is right now, um, I haven't had the time to do much more than just kind of keep up with my own writing career. So I uh, would have to rely on the the willingness of a novel, of a graphic novel, or of a an artist to find me and and bring that up. So, well, artists, maybe we can help. Come at me. Yeah, yeah. You guys, she's looking. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's try this. <laughs> NKJemison.com, right? Um, yes, yes. I would also be interested in video games, uh, movie adaptations. Film rights are available. <laughs> um, yeah. So mixed media, huge fan. A plus. All right. Come Very cool. Uh, we, we mostly answered Ben's question. He mm -hmm. says, Nora is a great name. Is there a reason why you use NK uh, instead with your books? Uh, would you ever not? Would you ever put out a book under Nora Jemison? Um, I guess I would. It, uh, I started using N.K. Jemison simply because I, I had a day job when I first started my writing career. I still have a day job. Um, and at the time, which was mm, 10, 12 years ago, um, Google had not yet mastered the, the art of tying pseudonyms to real names. And I actually thought that that was enough of a separation to... Uh, to keep things separate, and that doesn't work anymore. Got smarter. Um, <laughs> yeah. Got smarter. I wasn't expecting that. Um, but that said, uh, that was really the only reason um, was because I just I I thought that if I ever wanted to publish things under my real names, or if I thought that I wanted to publish things under my writer name, I thought that those would be separate. Um, as it is right now, 
It doesn't matter. Um, I, I think that the initials have become a kind of trademark, so I'm going to continue to use that trademark. Um, I think it gives me a certain degree of name recognition and recognizability. Um, and you don't give that up unless you have a reason to, unless you have to. Um, so I'm, I'm probably stuck with the N.K. Jemison until my sales tank. Let's hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> so hopefully you keep using it, yeah. Now, is yeah. the K actually like your, your middle initial? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, my middle name is Kata. Well then, yeah, because if they go to Nora, then you get confused with Nora Roberts, and then you're really in the romance section, and then that's like, you know. Yeah, I can compete with Nora Roberts. I'm not, I'm not gonna try. You can do a John Cougar thing and go like Nora K. Jemison, maybe. Or, oh yeah, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I could. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I suppose at some point in the future, I, I've seen different art, different writers try it in different ways. Um, more likely, if I ever ended up having to kind of reboot myself as a writer, I would use a completely different name um, and just start over from scratch. Um, but I don't know. So Ben also followed up, like, he, he says, you have become, whether intended to or not, as a, as a spokesperson for diversity in the world of science fiction and fantasy. Um, how do you feel about diversity in SF and, and being you know, the, having that role of spokesperson, if you even consider that something you have. Mm. I had not considered myself a spokesperson, so because I think of a spokesperson as a deliberate, conscious, consciously chosen role. Mm -hmm. um, and really, I'm just talking about myself and my life as a, a person who is uh, a science fiction and fantasy writer who is also black and female. Um, and these are things that I can't separate from myself. Um, just as a, a white male writer, you know, whether he or she, oh, sorry, he, if he's male, um, yeah, but just as, a, well, yeah, I suppose. Okay. Anyway, still working on that. Um, but just as a white male writer would um, not necessarily identify or discuss the fact that um, his race and his gender inform his writing, it does. And in my case, I do it consciously. I, I am aware of the fact that my race and my gender inform my writing simply because I'm doing it in a, in a setting in which my race and my gender are atypical. Um, but it's no different from if a white male writer decided to be out and sort of discussy about it. Um, discussy is a word. I've decided that it is. I like it. Um, but in my case, um, you know, I'm talking about the things that I deal with on a, on a regular daily basis. I talk about the fact that I go to a convention and somebody tries to touch my hair. I talk about the fact that um, I get odd questions sometimes about, you know, why on earth do you want to write epic fantasy as if we have no dreams or we have no, no mythology or no um, fantasy. So, um, and, and there's some things going on in the genre that I think... Uh, Make that, make that tendency to ask those kinds of questions problematic, and I talk about that. But it's not, you know, me setting out to be the spokesperson for diversity, any of that stuff. I, I'm just talking about my life. And in this case, the personal is political, as feminists say. Um, and, it, you know, the fact that it is a, a spokesperson role or the fact that some people regard it as controversial... Um, really doesn't have anything to do with me. It has to do with the way that the rest of the genre works. Yeah, and the fact that there aren't as many people speaking about it. I think that, that, there that are a lot causes... More, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, That over the course of my writing career, I've seen, I've seen the genre change from a place where you just didn't discuss race and gender that much. Um, it was done in a very quiet, very, very delicate, very polite way. Um, and people sort of assumed that science fiction and fantasy, by virtue of being a place where geekiness was accepted, um, was accepting of everything else, too. Um, everybody really kind of took Gene Roddenberry's infinite diversity and infinite combinations to heart and thought that, you know, if we just toss out the IDIC thing, lots and, and talk about that, um, then that solves the problem. But um, meanwhile, you, then you've got people who are like, uh, we're going to do a LERP set in medieval Europe, and no, you can't play because you're black, mm -hmm. and there are no black people in medieval Europe. Or you can't play a, a, a warrior because you're a woman, and you know you don't have any breastplate armor that has giant tits on it. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Can I say tits? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Sure. Anyway. Um, and... You know, so so these are the kinds of things that, that the, the geekosphere is gradually starting to realize is telling yourself that you welcome diversity is entirely different from actually welcoming diversity. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and um, a lot of work still has to be done. But the fact is that now people are talking about it, and they're talking about it openly and in some cases angrily, and that's not a bad thing. Um, the anger is, is from long suppression, and the anger is cathartic. It is a healing thing. Um, so I think that as long as people keep talking, the genre will continue to improve. You know, uh, Morgan's next question, I, I think you may have uh, illustrated a little bit because uh, you have a full-time day job. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, 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 <laughs> uh, but for most people, your day job would be enough. She wants to know, how do you balance that with writing, revisions, and everything else you have to do as an author? I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> uh, mostly, uh, it... it you know, this is this is going to sound probably bad, but it's it's a good thing that I don't have any children because I would be a terrible mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't imagine putting children on top of all of you do. I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, there are writers who do it. I don't know if I'd be able to. So um, I my day job, though, fortunately, is the kind of day job that I actually enjoy. And and I'm in a career field where um, interacting and the way that I do recharges me and gives me sometimes stories or the material for stories. And so I go off and I write kind of a stress relief from the day job. And then the day job sometimes is stress relief from the writing career. So, so far they've managed to nicely complement each other. Um, time is becoming an issue. Uh, as my writing career takes off, I'm finding uh, it harder and harder to meet deadlines and, and travel and do all of the things that a professional writer is expected to do. Um, and so far I've managed to keep the, the balls juggled in the air, but um, maybe at some point in the future, should I sell film rights? <laughs> um, Maybe at some point in the future, um, I will be able to to reduce the day job to to probably part time. I would never want to give it up. Um, mm -hmm. I, I am always going to be one of those writers that never wants to quit her day job simply because, like I said, I actually like my day job. Um, and uh, I also briefly, uh, right after I got the book contract for The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms, I actually took one year off just to sort of see what it was like um, and decided I was going to try playing full-time writer for a year. And I was miserable. Mm. I was bored out of my mind. Um, I wasn't leaving the house often enough. Um, I wasn't having enough human interaction with other people. Uh, I could... I was discovering that basically I needed to have other things to think about in order for my mind to generate uh, appropriate levels of creativity. So um, I will never give up the day job, but I would like to reduce it. Um, we'll see. It sounds Maybe. like the two jobs are symbiotic. I think I think that's the case for every writer. Mm -hmm. um, writers don't pull this stuff out of nowhere. Writers have to have some sort of of theater for their creativity, especially writers of speculative fiction, um, because we, we live in the everyday world and therefore, you know, that's the, the fuel for us coming up with, with uh, the, the magic that we end up seeing in our everyday lives. Um, one of my short stories actually came from my daily commute to work. Huh. Um, uh, uh, non-zero probabilities is what it's called, um, and it's it's highly fantasized because it's set in a world where the laws of physics and probability go out of hay go haywire, um, and extreme things tend to happen. Um, but it was, you know, if I lived in a world like that, it would be me walking to work, um, uh, riding my little subway train, um, seeing the subway train have a freak accident because magic. Um, you know, when you're riding on the subway train and it's on an elevated track and you look down and you think, what happens if, and then you write a story about that. Um, you need that daily mundane interaction to successfully write fantasy, in my opinion. Um, and some people get it from their families. Some people get it from, um, you know, just interacting with people on a random basis. In my case, I get it from from work, from my family, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but work is definitely part of it. All right, that's time for the super questions. Uh, oh. These are two, uh, two big questions we come up with to finish the interview. We've asked several offers some of these same questions. Uh, the first one, what is, and you may not have this yourself, but maybe it's something you've heard. What is your favorite deadline extension excuse? <laughs> um, my day job is a fantastic one, um, nice. but I've, I've always wanted to use velociraptors, and, mm. and I've never found an easy way to use velociraptors. Um, and, and my editor is one who probably would buy 
that that you know Velociraptors had attacked and and had eaten my my MacBook and therefore <laughs> I could not get the manuscript in. Except that she knows I use Dropbox. So, oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you can yeah, say the rat, the Velociraptor eviscerated your laptop. Right, and so huh? you can't you can't re get the backup yet because you need to get a new laptop. And the there Velociraptors are surrounding the computer store. That would be nice. They that do nice. that. I've always wanted to use the Velociraptors, but I have not actually done so. They're very clever. Very yes. clever girls. No I... one expects the surprise Velociraptor. No. <laughs> All right. And our final question. Uh, what sci-fi fantasy trope do you think needs a little rest? A little rest. sleep, a little nap, trope nap. So many. Um, hmm. I had a great conversation. Um, oh, gosh, I'm drawing a complete blank on his name i'm looking at my bookcase sorry um wow i had a fantastic conversation with a writer whose name i can't remember right now um but that said it was about the chosen one trope mm -hmm. um and how and which is kind of hilarious because the hundred thousand kingdoms focuses on a chosen one essentially um although she's not chosen by anybody in particular mm -hmm. um and she sort of falls into it but you know a, a lot of times that that's what happens with chosen ones um but you know i i I am not a fan of seeing chosen ones who are essentially um, idealizations of of what people think that the reader of epic fantasy is going to be. Um, and I'm not talking just about epic fantasy. It tends to be all American in this case, uh, or in some cases, English language media. Um, but the chosen one is, is so often um, young, white, male. Um, a little downtrodden but not very um has a great destiny awaiting him or her which usually involves uh becoming king of some place um and i feel like there's a lot of different ways that you can go with that you can change the makeup of the chosen one you can also change where they're going you can still have somebody who is you know touched by the finger of the gods or whatever particular thing it is that chooses them um but you you should have something that kind of takes them in a different direction from simply becoming king and reinforcing the existing power structure um, of whatever fantasy land or you know occasionally science fiction land that you happen to be in. Um, so let's have a chosen one who who is a king and decides screw this I'm going to become a farm boy um, and and that's the fulfillment of the destiny that I have worked towards all my life is a world in which the working man can be truly fulfilled and have a wonderful life um, I am a socialist by the way <laughs> <laughs> you know so, so yeah th these are the directions that my, my head tends to go in um, so yeah that particular trope I'd like to see change not die but change drastically okay, flip it on its head a little bit Yeah, a little bit a little like bit that. Or just make it go sideways, maybe. Yeah. It is always odd to me that in Arthurian legend, Arthur is the big champion of the people until he wins, and then he becomes a Roman king, who's, yeah. just, who's just like yeah. the emperor that he was rebelling against in the first place. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's assumed that he will be a good king, but, right. you know, he's still king. And it's good to be the king, but, you know, that said, um, yeah. I want to see I mean, Arthur's reform program. Like, what was he going to do about the farm subsidies and... Yeah, 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 that would be interesting to see. Yeah. But uh, I don't, I don't expect much from kings. But I am a socialist, so yeah. Anyway, right. <laughs> well, Nora, thank you so much for joining us on the show, and of course, being back on Sword and Laser again. Okay, well, thanks very much again for inviting me. This was a lot of fun, um, and hope that you guys have a lovely rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. You, but this, you are our uh, season finale. Oh too, yeah, we so. forgot to tell you that you're the season finale. Oh wow! I feel all schmancy now. Yeah. I know we should have we should have poured some drinks at the space bar, but uh, it's kind of difficult on Skype. Just, uh, that would just torment me more, though. Yeah, exactly. I see the cups are the cups empty behind you? Maybe. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For right now. <laughs> later, later, probably not so much. Kevin Hearn took all of the liquor, so. Yeah. Well, lift a cup to me uh, and, and think of me as you enjoy. Thank Always. Thank you very much, Nora. Thank you. All right, her most recent novel, The Shadowed Sun, came out in June 2012, and her next novel, The Fifth Season, comes out August 5th. And that, my friends, is it for That's season it, for two. For reals, yeah. Will there be a season three? 
I hope so. Probably, <laughs> uh, but there's always more Sword and Laser. If you if you want more of what we have to offer, we will continue. We've got audio podcasts, we've got the anthology, we've got all kinds of Google Hangouts and more at swordandlaser.com. And of course, join in our Goodreads group at goodreads.com. Yes. We'll see you there. Thank you for making this all happen once again, you guys. You're the best, and we'll see you next season. Bye. <laughs>